And we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, I have with me Christopher Mowdy. Um, I met Christopher not too long ago. I think it was just a few weeks ago. That's right. Uh, via Math Pig. Shout out to Math Pig. Um, and we immediately had a conversation, I think, about the uh, relationship between philosophy and psychology. And I knew that uh, I needed to get Christopher on my channel. So welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your day for this chat. The pleasure is absolutely mine, Michael. The conversation that you jumped into couldn't have been more perfect. Math pig somehow, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? conjured you like a <laughs> hollow right. deck i was in the middle of an argument with people who were saying that psychology is not a science right. and i was saying well psychology is essentially experimental philosophy and they were thinking like natural philosophy that eventually turned into like the hard sciences and you know it was an engineer and and somebody who right. had had a more physics take on what philosophy was and here i am being like psychology mental events it's experimental philosophy it's a science and they're like no and no and here you come like of course psychology is a science it essentially is the extension of philosophy and i was like oh my god <laughs> like you were like a god if i believed in god you right. would you were a godsend it was just a wonderful introduction to you and from then on i was like i need this guy on my radar so well here we are. yes it was uh fate brought us together so uh <laughs> chris um if you wouldn't mind so i'm going to be speaking with chris of course now and next weekend uh today we're going to be talking about the psychology of perception Next weekend, we're going to kind of use today as kind of a, a basis, a foundation to kind of launch into a conversation about the psychology of consciousness. Yes. So, Chris, before we get there, though, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, that sort of thing. Well, when it comes right down to brass tacks, I am just a funk bass player. <laughs> but above and beyond that, I do happen to work. <laughs> wow to all musicians out there i did not for i didn't mean for that to be the slam that it sounded like um <laughs> i need to soak that in just for a second of how shitty i just was to all musicians in that one statement oh am i allowed to curse uh, go for it okay I'm, sure. I'm gonna keep it yeah. light i'll keep it light i'll keep it okay. light um anywho so my name's christopher mowdy um my full-time job is i manage a laboratory for Dr. Pamela Dalton at a place called the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia. The Monell Center is focused on basic science revolving around the chemical senses. The chemical senses are smell, taste, and irritation. And of course, you can see how this would also impact things like nutrition, right? And things like COVID, considering that anosmia is a symptom. So our center is like the Mecca for all things chemical senses and our laboratory, the laboratory that I manage and I have for the past 23 years, we focus on the psychology of the sense of smell. So it's experimental psychology, right? And the way that I usually describe it is psychology is an umbrella term under which there is a clinical branch and there's an experimental branch. I'm working in the experimental branch. Aside from my full-time job, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to, you have something no, no, to say? No, go ahead. I, I do have some, a little bit of questions for you, but go ahead. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm made of answers for good questions, and I'm also made of questions because I'm interested in what you do. So, anywho, my part-time job is I lecture at my alma mater. I graduated from Rutgers Camden with my bachelor's in psych. I currently teach in the psychology department at Rutgers Camden. So I am super fortunate that my teachers 30 years ago are now my colleagues. So I feel very honored to be teaching at Rutgers. 
I'm honored to be teaching psychology and uh, I'm honored to be here talking about the psychology because I'm like the biggest cheerleader for psychology. The fact that you want to talk to me about that thing is it blows my mind. And so I'm super happy to be here to talk about it. Awesome. I was going to ask you, I get this question a lot from some of my students. Um, so I, I teach uh, at a high school as well as at a college level. And my high schoolers are always really interested in what got people to where they are today. So what got you interested in psychology, um, specifically in the area that you're working in um, and doing like laboratory work? Was this always an interest for you? Did it kind of come around later in life? Is this kind of what you always knew you wanted to do? That sort of thing. That was a really well worded question because it taps. I'm, I'm, I'm able to answer it in three acts. Act one, when I was a kid, I adored all of the What's the word I want to use? All of the trappings of science. When I was a little kid, I'm 51 years old. When I was a little kid, Gilligan's Island was on TV. Guess which character resonated with me? The professor, right? I asked for a microscope from the Sears um, catalog for Christmas. So I was that kid. I had, I had a telescope kit. I thought that the professor was the coolest person on earth, right? And also, I, com I didn't understand why people thought differently than me. So th that's kind of chapter one with like the, the curiosity about the way people think. And also, I, I noticed, I noticed wordplay early in a way that like, I noticed that when I said something with a certain intention, it could easily be interpreted in a way that completely was the opposite of my intention. And that dynamic blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as, um, I remember my mom was going out grocery shopping and I said something off the top of my head. I was just like, Man, it's been a long time since we had Cheerios. Right. She came home. And she's like, I got Cheerios because you asked for them. And I was like, I didn't ask for Cheerios. I was just commenting like, oh, hey, we haven't had Cheerios in a long time. Not necessarily that I wanted them. I was just saying that out loud. Instances like that where it was like, oh, so I could be clearer. Mm -hmm. um, people have different goals when they hear what I'm saying. Like all of that, that whole internal game of communication, essentially, which to me is psychology because we're social creatures. So, so that's act one. Act two, how did I get my current job? I think that's where I want to go with that. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. How did I get into psychology proper? That's act two. So I wanted to be a rock star, right? Nice. I'm a musician. I'm a funk bass player. Back in the day, I was a rock bass player. Like I said, I'm 51. So when I graduated high school in 1989, hair metal was the, the thing, right? That was the most <laughs> popular style of music. Guys that looked like girls with makeup and long hair and pooched out, you know, Aquanet, you know, mains, that like was the thing to do. And I fell full, fully into it. Like I moved to Hollywood, California when I was 18 years old. I tried to make it as a rock star, came nice. back to, to fill a, a bake, came back home to Jersey, ended up going to school in Philadelphia. While I was at the school in Philadelphia, which was a jazz school, but it was a school where I had to take a core curriculum of um, humanities. And so one of those electives was a developmental psychology class. Um, um, boxer you don't briefs. have to answer that. <laughs> the boxer briefs. It's, I, I forgot the name of them. And I forgot, I forgot it's an exactly, it's a portmanteau of the two words. It's not even a portmanteau. It's just the two words, boxer briefs. If it were a portmanteau, it would be box chiefs. Anyway, boxers. Anyway. <laughs> Experimental so, psychology, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I end up taking a developmental psychology course developmental. and in 
taking it, it was like all these questions I had about how is it that people think differently than me? My upbringing is different. Like I remember going to dinner at friends' houses and I was like, you know, why do they do those things at dinner that I don't do? And blah, 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 blah. All these like diff noticing individual differences. And it was almost like if I believed in God, the hand of God kind of came down and touched me and they're like, Chris, this is, this is the field that will answer all of those tacit questions that you have going on in the background. So that's act two. I left music school to pursue psychology. In case you can't tell, I'm gregarious. So when I was a student in, at Rutgers for psychology, all of the teachers that taught the courses that I liked or that taught courses that I didn't like but taught them well, I made sure that I made myself known to them. I would stop by during their known business office hours, business hours, office hours, and just say hi, like, hey, I'm Chris, I'm a student in your blah, blah, blah class. I had a question about this, that, or the other, whether it was specific about class or broad. Like, mm -hmm. so like, what, what field of psychology do you actually work in? Like, I know that you, you know, you taught this class in this class, and they don't have anything to do with each other. So like, what do you do? Right. Like simple questions like that. And they'd be like, oh, check this out. Uh, blah, blah. And they'd sit down and like talk me through what they do. That ended up paying up dividends. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's, went to school for uh, music therapy, decided nice. I didn't want to be a music therapist. Um, and three years after I graduated from my bachelor's, one of my professors called me at home, looked my name up in the white pages called me at home and I knew it was him because next to my phone was the caller ID unit that everybody had and it said his name, you know? And so I picked it up and I was like, Dr. Whitlow, what, what, to what do I owe the pleasure? He's like, Hey, Chris, do you have a job? I was like, yeah, but I want to quit. He's like, I know somebody who wants somebody who you would be the person to be that body. And I was like, okay, what's this? He's like, it's, it's a lab. I was like, I was like, Dr. Whitlow, I've never worked in a lab. He's like, it's cool, dude. I remember you. It's going to be fine. It ends up, I went for the interview. The interview was with his wife at the time. Since then, they've been divorced. I'm still working for Pam. And that was 23 years ago. That's how I got wow. into the field that I got into. I wasn't initially interested in the psychology of smell, mm -hmm. but... I was, I was given an offer, an opportunity. I was offered an opportunity that I felt I couldn't refuse. Awesome. And as you're working in this lab, music's also just kind of been a, a side project, side interest, hobby of yours. In my mind, music and science are exactly the same. Mm. Like to me or, or maybe it's the way that i approached it right so we can always, we can talk about this fun dynamic of um do fields just are, are they a calling to a certain type of people or when you do you, when you start working in a field do you start changing your behaviors to conform to the mold that's expected right mm -hmm. i think that i was meant to be a scientist because even when i was pursuing music i approached practice like they were pilot studies, hmm. right? I kept a journal, I kept a log, I kept notes. I was able to do this exercise at 120 beats per minute yesterday. I should be able to do it at 121 beats per minute today at least. You know, almost like it was an exercise regiment. And then like, I just, I just approached everything like, like it was a science project. So when we finally got, when I finally got into the lab, I was like, oh, I know how to do this. And then additionally, science has a, creative component having to do with I have a question that I want answered and I have a limited amount of resources available to get that answer mm -hmm. how do I logistically use what I have to answer this question that is a creative process of writing protocols right because if you had an infinite amount of money an infinite amount of time you could do anything, but nobody has either of those things. So to me, creativity is freedom within limits. Okay, cool. We can spend this much. We have this equipment. Maybe we can buy this with the budget. 
here's the moving pieces, here's mm. the limits, be free within that. Creativity. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for answering that. So let's uh, jump into perception. Okay. Where should we start? Well, all perception starts with sensation. Mm. Right? I think that that would be a pretty logical place to start. And without going into literally the anatomy of everything, we can just we can just tacitly mention we're talking about vision, we're talking about smell and taste, we're talking about hearing, and we're talking about the cutaneous senses, feeling, touch. And also, if we want to do another one, we can talk about the vestibular senses of balance, hmm. which are attached to the, the hearing apparatus. But from those senses, our brain does something to it. The way that our brain processes those senses can fit in a bucket that we can call perception. Hmm. Now, here's the part that I want. I want to start with this because I, I kind of want this to be controversial in a way that we can kind of unpack to make it less and less controversial um, as we go. Most of us think that our brain is like a mouse trap, waiting for a stimulus to respond to. I'm going to posit that the most recent psychological research demonstrates that every experience that we have is already put out there by our brains and we are living in the simulation that is the predictions that our brains make that is perception that's perception for what we consider the external world what we consider the internal world physical realities social realities, emotions, and feelings. It, it covers every, consciousness, right? Which is what we're going to talk about next week. Consciousness is where experience happens. We're going to leave that for next week. But for this week, we're going to say it is not a stimulus response. It okay. is a perpetual simulation that we're living in based on our predictions. And that's what our perceptions are. Okay. I'll leave it open to questions from there. Yeah, no, let's unpack that because that's, right. um, I, I like how you put it. So say that first part to me again because I was um, responding, acknowledging someone in the chat. But I got you. So sensation. Sensation. Perception so brain... is... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you go for our, it. Our brain processes that sensation, right? Mm -hmm. That processing is perception. But even the language I just used made it sound like our brain is just waiting for a stimulus to trigger it to, to do something. Like, let's take emotions for an example. It's almost like we're taught that we have apps in our brain the anger app, and when it is triggered by an outside source, we go through a cascade of postures, facial expressions, feeling states, you know, vocal inflections, right? That is the anger app when it is triggered, or the happiness app, or the surprise app. And we're kind of taught that these are apps that are triggered like apps are from the outside in. What I'm trying to say is, our perceptions are always generated from the inside out. Hmm. Okay. So let's, uh, and I don't necessarily know if we want to get too bogged down in like anatomy and physiology, but I happen to really love anatomy and physiology. Let's get as deep into it as we have. To. <laughs> so let's take something that, you know, I think what, immediately comes to mind for most <laughs> we'll, we'll be testing everybody on the parts of the brain exactly the smile on your face when i busted that out was priceless <laughs> give me flashbacks yeah yeah uh i had to take a, uh i anatomy was my favorite subject and favorite science subject in high school 
And so I thought I would take anatomy at like a college level and the, 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 the level of difference there was anyway. So let's take something like sight. Mm -hmm. So, and I've always been really interested in this and I want to get your thoughts. So break it down for me. We get external stimulus that, that comes from the light yes. that hits our eyes. Um, that is tr uh, translated, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. translated into signals that go from our eyes to our brain. Yep. And you, you stop me if this is sounding too ridiculous, but... No, but I want to let you know that you're starting in the middle from my perspective. Okay. Your beginning is actually my middle. Okay. Right. You're making it sound like there's something out there that starts out there, and mm -hmm. that's the beginning. And once that out there gets in here, that's where it begins. I'm trying to... I'm making the case through current research and other people who are smarter than me, right? This isn't the Chris yeah. Mowdy theory, right? Let's not be crazy. I'm relying on smarter people than me. But what I am saying is it actually starts in here because our brain is a prediction machine because of efficiency. And those predictions, at least in humans, create a simulation within that simulation your story begins. But do you see how my story starts with the creation of the simulation that facilitates the beginning of your story? Okay. Yes. So yes. the simulation and also let's start with the let's start with a vision idea. Grant humor me for a quick story. Imagine you're a soldier being and you're deployed and your job is to look for the enemy and their troops. And there are enemy troops in the area that you are patrolling. And you are primed to look for them and to shoot them. Hmm. It also happens to be the case that the area that, that you're patrolling and looking for your enemy for, there are roving bands of shepherds. Okay. Because your vision is primed to see an enemy, there are instances and in stories where people see a shepherd, interpret that as the thing they predict to see, and have to be stopped before they shoot the innocent shepherd, thinking it is the thing that their brain predicted. In that moment, they're in touch with reality because reality was different from their prediction and therefore had to interrupt. Normally we don't, if we don't have those interruptions, we don't actually contact reality. We just predict if the predictions are correct, our predictions are met and we don't have to actually contact reality. It is only when there's prediction error that reality steps in and is an external influence in the way that you're talking about hmm. because it contradicts the prediction and simulation that we cast in front of us. Gotcha. No, that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. Also, I happen to have, if you want to do the screen share, I happen to have yes. a slide right now talking specifically. Oh no, I think I have the wrong one. Hold on one second. Stop that. I'm going to try a different one. Um, which one is this? Chapter four. There we go. Please share that. Okay, this one. So it's kind of difficult to see, and I apologize for that. But this is literally what you're talking about, visual input. So for those of us familiar with brain anatomy, we know that the thalamus which is on top of our brainstem, is the relay station. Relay station meaning all of the tidbits of information we get from the periphery that goes into our spinal cord, hits the thalamus, and the thalamus determines what part of our cortex it should go to. Conversely, it takes the motor programs of the cortex telling us what to do, 
through the thalamus and goes through the spinal cord and navigates those motor functions. With that in mind, because our visual cortex is in our occipital lobe, right? if this is our brain looking this, looking this way, this would be the occipital lobe. Occipital lobe is in the back of your head. So your visual signals immediately go to your occipital lobe and then hit your thalamus to determine what to do with that information. Because of the simulation that I was telling you about, once it hits the thalamus, it does something differently than if it was a brand new piece of information being impinged on the eyes for the first time. Okay. So does that kind of answer, does that help answer the question? Because you, you were coming from it, it sounded like you were coming from it from a, with a visual example because it seemed so... It seemed like a good rudimentary example to kind of try to unpack it. Is that right. fair? No, I, I think I got understand what you're saying. So, um, l but let me make sure that I'm understanding it because that can be a little dense at times. Well, paraphrase it, please. So, um, so I I see the cup, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we break that down a little bit, what I hear you saying is like, it's not just, so my assumption was that uh, sensation is caused directly by the external world kind of forcing itself on me, impinging on me, yes. right? But what you're saying is that there's also this uh, interpretive process that's taking place. So it's not, in other words, it's not like, it's not like I'm getting the raw data. There's, there's other stuff happening maybe some filtering taking place. I don't know if this is the right jargon, but mm -hmm. maybe some filtering taking place in you the agree. brain that's uh, also affecting <clears throat> affecting what, I, what, I, what I'm sensing, in this case, what I'm seeing. Um, would color be a good example of that? Um, color could be a good example, but using, using your cup as an example, I think that what we could say is, which is a beautiful cup, I think that what we could say is you in in order to know it is an object in your vicinity that you could reach for and touch and reliably do that and bring to your mouth and stuff all of those require predictions of where it is what it looks like right if you grabbed that cup and it all of a sudden changed color to a purple version of that cup you're that would be a prediction error that you'd have to adjust for. And there might be a perfectly good explanation for it. You might have a thermo cup that changes color based on the temperature of the whatever's in it, and you just didn't know it, right? Something like that. Otherwise, it would be a jarring prediction error to have something like that change color, right? Like your prediction to change so drastically. So in general, when you take a sip from that cup, Nothing about your predictions have changed unless you accidentally knock it over, right? Which was a misjudgment of where it was spatially and your proprioception kind of misjudgment, you know, stuff like that. But aside from those kinds of errors, if you successfully navigate the task of taking the sip from that cup and all your predictions are met, nothing about the nothing from the outside world is l really impinging on you. Okay. No, that doesn't now, make sense. Yeah. This, now, this does, this is based on a very specific idea of how ideas are categorized and what we do with categorized thoughts, because all thoughts are categorized. It's how we process memories as quickly as we do. But without going too much into detail with that right now, using your cup example, every time you take a sip from the cup, assuming you don't knock it over or something doesn't deviate from your expectation, you're really not engaging with your external environment because your simulation is flawless. Okay. So let's 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 couch that in the in the in the frame of perception. So your perceptions are based on not what the environment brings to you new, but how the environment changes what you already know is going to happen. Those are two very different strategies. It's the, it's the difference between winning and not having to lose, right? 
Winning is perpetually having to achieve to get more and more and more. Not having to lose is just knowing that you're going to win and not fucking up. So, pardon my language. So, <laughs> the, the, the model that I'm trying to um, put forward is the second. It's a not losing. It's like your predictions are so good that you're kind of coasting and you're only adjusting when it, when it gets twisted as compared to always having to reinvent categories of events as you perceive them each time. Both of them involve induction, but mine involves induction as an ingredient for prediction with prediction and simulation being the, the, the crux, the, the heavily weighted variable. Okay. And one more related question to that and then... I'll allow you to move forward and I'll stop with my questions here. But um, I'm guessing that you mentioned um, your interest in developmental psychology yeah. earlier. Um, I'm guessing that we we could see this play out developmentally in children mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form. Statistical learning. Perception, right? Because they're not going to be born knowing all of this stuff. Exactly. Uh, maybe Plato was wrong, but... Um, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I love you so much. <laughs> that was great. Right. So it seems like there there might be a uh, maybe a little bit of a learning curve, especially with like, um, would it be kinetic intelligence or or spatial reasoning that sort of thing? All right. So since you brought it up, it, it was almost like I paid you for this perfect segue in the same way that you asked the perfect question that allowed me to lay out three acts as my answer. Allow me to address this. The way that we as adult humans put forth simulations that are our predictions, it begins in our youth. As adults, we do this thing called statistical learning. But when we're young, we, it is our main way of understanding and perceiving the environment. It is the main way that we categorize events so that it's not all one big mushad, right? So that there are clearly delineated words when they're listening to somebody talk, when they're listening to somebody use their prosodic envelope, because of course, when they're infants, we're all Charlie Brown's teacher, right? <laughs> all those little pauses, the human brain, as we're infants, we're hardwired to pick up statistically where the pauses are, when the starts start, what makes them different. And from that, we develop language acquisition. Hmm. Language acquisition is the ultimate demonstration of statistical learning. But like I said, we do it as adults. When we're in a new environment and we're looking for cues and we implicitly learn things, we're, we're statistically learning without you know deliberately trying to learn anything. Um, but when we're children, it is our main way of categorizing our percepts and building inductively the repertoire of experiences that we need to project accurately into the future, right? Got a couple of questions for you here, kind of based oh. on what you were just saying. Jeez, <laughs> this guy. So the first is from Math Pig, and I actually was thinking of something similar. So Math Pig, I'm glad you asked this. Uh, does growing up with the different language as your primary, the fact that cultures describe colors, for example, differently, can it bias a perception? Yes. So think of it this way. And this is something that we were talking about in the hang just the other night. It was just last night or two nights ago or whatever. Um. You look at the rainbow, and there are no clear distinctions between colors. We have it chalked up as Roy G. Biv, right? Seven colors. But there are cultures that have words for up to nine or 12 colors of the same rainbow that we're all looking at. Now, if you can divvy up what we consider seven chunks into 12 chunks, you're living in a different world. Your perceptions are different. Your understanding of color is different than ours. Ours being the people who have the seven colors. 
So um, there's that. That's growing up in a culture using uh, descriptive colors, right? Like literally using words changes your experience. Let's go back to emotions very quickly. Yeah. When children are using their statistical learning as they are feeling the feelings that they have that are emotions, the words that they're learning to attribute to those feelings becomes a social reality for them. So depending on the culture that you're raised in, you have different words for how you feel. Different cultures have words for feelings that we don't. There are Swedish words that I can't pronounce just for the feeling of sitting down with a friend over coffee. Like there's a word for that that I, that I can't pronounce it. I can't even spell it, but it exists. We don't have a word for that. Mm -hmm. right so examples like that are abound you know there are some cultures that have many different um versions of anger and some that have none at all they don't even have a word for anger so like what reality are they living what perceptions right let me rephrase that what predictions are they making about the world that are being met in their culture that if they were dropped into our culture would not be met. Gotcha. Um, we have another question here. Um, when people slide into dementia, I've seen a phase where they get irritated. How does this fit into his modeling of not having to win in everyday interactions with cups? I don't understand the with cups bit, but um, so think of um, people with dementia as I understand it, the agitation process. Now, I am not a clinical psychologist. Let me first put that out there, right? I, I do not do clinical psychology. And so right now, what I'm about to say is complete speculation based on the experimental body of work that I, that, that I do I have an understanding of. So sliding into dementia, dementia being specifically the, um, how can I put this? it is uh, considered a neurodegenerative disorder. So just based on that word, right? Neuro meaning brain and nerves, your nervous system, degenerative. So you're losing memories, you're losing touch with reality because um, as your brain breaks down, it's, in a, it's, it's losing its ability to process those sensory inputs that are fed through predictions and the predictions might become more and more erratic and inaccurate such that the real world input is just so drastically different than what you expect that you'd get frustrated too. like put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is demented right assuming that you're not demented if they had realistic expectations which they don't and those realistic expectations were being deviated from in the way that they feel they are which they're not you'd be justified in being super frustrated. But so sometimes agitation and dementia is kind of explained through that lens. Hmm. I think, and this is pure conjecture on my part, but based on what you just said, uh, this also seems to relate to um, different sorts of mental illness, right? Okay. Um, I mean, if you look at something like... Uh, take your pick um schizophrenia would probably be the kind of extreme example there but even something like depression sure. where your view of the world is how i heard it a therapist right put all my cards on the table right uh, a therapist explained it to me one time as if you're wearing like colored glasses right but you don't realize mm -hmm. you're wearing colored glasses so you're seeing the world in a particular way. Yes. Right. And then the goal is to, to take off those glasses to realize that how you are viewing the world is not actually how the world is or how you're viewing yourself is not how the world is. So it sounds like you can kind of build a comprehensive theory out from this view of perception that you're saying to account for a phenomenon like mental illness. Now I want to make a clear distinction. Dementia, yeah is different than mental illness in that dementia is a medical disorder that affects psychology, whereas mental disorders usually are specifically mental 
disorders. They're psychological disorders. There may or may not be some biological components to it, but you know, we also have to go with the idea that everything psychological is biological. Mm-hmm. But talking about depression, different than dementia, right? Dementia is literally like parts of your brain are degenerating, causing these psychological symptoms. Um, right. <clears throat> for people with the genetic propensity for depression, I'm one of them. I have bipolar disorder. So I have hypomanic phases around March and then fall. um, uh, Yeah, fall is usually a bad time for me. But with my understanding of perception combined with things like mindfulness practice and meditation, mindfulness practice and meditation with this understanding of how perception works for somebody like me who suffers from depression is a godsend because the way that, uh, and this is also kind of a cognitive behavioral uh, therapy technique called framing. When I can frame my bad moods, when I know that I'm starting to dip, as this is something my brain does. And I also know that when my brain starts spiraling towards topics that lead towards bad consequences, I can just un I can recognize that I'm having those thoughts and untether from them. It takes practice. I practice mindfulness meditation an hour a day. But mindfulness meditation is is something we're going to talk more about next week is taking on board in an actionable way that consciousness is just where experience happens. And experience is perceptions based on what we project into the world and we're responsible for those projections so as applied to mental disorders there are ways forward with this model combined with things like mindfulness meditation cognitive behavioral therapy that are literally actionable this isn't just like pie in the sky like oh i'm projecting a simulation it's like the sims and but but i'm not talking obtuse abstract shit i'm talking real world actionable shit Hmm. so i mean that's where i'm coming from with it that's and for me that's how it connects with mental health yeah shout out to therapy by the way that's (laughs) that's good stuff chris we have a lot of questions i'm i'm sorry to um (laughs) divert from the path that you were going but we need to uh, apologize good thing we're having this in two parts so our next question from simos thanks for joining simos uh can smell reinforce our perpetual bias for learning perceptual sorry can smell reinforce our perceptual bias for learning such as the smell of lemon so uh, simos is trolling me right now is he (laughs) yes (laughs) Knowing that I work in psychology of smell and knowing that I'm the cult leader of a cult that hates lemon bars, <laughs> um, he's, he's trolling me. But I do think that he genuinely has a, a – he, there's a genuine question in here that his trolling is kind of working its way around. Can smell reinforce perceptional bias for learning? Yes. Right? I've done studies where I've piped crappy smells into somebody's nostrils as they had to work an obstacle course, carrying heavy weights, memorizing the code to a lockbox, right? With flashlights, not flashlights, what are those? Strobe lights and distracting auditory things going on, right? Even though it's a multimodal way of distracting somebody, the shitty smells absolutely is a way to, of offsetting someone's cognitive load it's just so it's difficult not to think about towards the positive end i don't know of any olfactory cues that make you better at learning hmm. interesting um let me get to another question i have my questions but i'll write them <laughs> down and ask them to you later because what I was thinking is, um, uh, 
when I was doing my undergrad degree, um, one of the things that often happens when you take an intro to psych class is you can volunteer for psychological studies for extra oh, you credit. Ha- it's mandatory. Not right. good. It's <laughs> mandatory. You have to. It's worth 10 percentage points. Oh, okay. Uh, it was it was extra credit for me. Uh, I thought it was really fun, so I, I signed up for more than I had. That's to. unethical. You can't have it as extra credit for class. <laughs> that is unethical. The IRB would never approve that. I won't. Uh, I won't tell you what school I went to. But oh, um, ma, no, that's a horror <laughs> show. <laughs> um, one of the studies I signed up for and uh, was whether or not it had to do with perception. And it had to do with performance. Uh, Now, this wasn't like cognitive learning per se, but it was uh, measuring how long you could perform a specific task given different settings. Um, Nice. And so the the experiment was if uh, I was in I was in a group that was in a room that had a lot of plants, and the task was to see how long we could hold one of those like hand exercise machines. I don't know what they're called. Thing you squeeze. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to see how long we would hold, we could hold those, the hand squeezy thing down for. And, um, you know, they, they send you the results afterwards to let you know, like, what the study was about and what the findings were. And the findings were that um, that the group in the room with the plants could hold it longer or were more inclined to hold it longer because of the i don't know if it was because of the 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 plants themselves or because of being mm-hmm. in like nature per se but i could imagine that you could maybe repeat something similar with like s- good smells mm-hmm. i don't know yeah i think that there might without a doubt like heavy in learning and associative learning being what it is if you were to study under the fragrance of a very specific, like, let's say, candle, and you were able to access that, like, during tests, like beads, and if you were able to infuse beads with the same fragrance, that is your candle, such that during testing, you can smell it and have a, at least one kind of multimodal way of experiencing the way that you studied, right? I can see how that would help, but I I think that that would be a preference thing, and a consistency thing versus a fragrance thing. Gotcha. That makes sense. Uh, we have another question here from Nanalu. I'm not sure if I pronounced your name right. I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned balance as a sense. Are there other examples of categories besides the five, main five? Yes. So proprioception is the ability to sense your body in space. And the most important one to my theory, which is not my theory, which is the theory that I just happen to be a cheerleader for, is interoception. Interoception is your mind's perpetual updating and appraisal of its internal states. Now, interoception is very important when you combine it with this perception theory and you combine it with this consciousness theory it pretty much explains emotions because emotions are nothing but your brain's interoceptive analysis of what's happening in your body and placing its meaning within the context of what is happening around you based on previous experience that is literally a definition of emotions gotcha Thank you. And I apologize to everyone in the chat if we can't get to all these questions. I didn't expect for there to be that many, uh, but we got quite a few. So we'll we'll work our way through. I'm bringing, I'm bringing the fire, brother. I'm bringing the fire. I got Apparently. people asking questions. Coming out of the goddamn woodwork asking these questions. So we have another one from MathPig. Um, what do the studies show on the perception of reality from an autistic sense of view where the information can push the limits so the brain then reverts to emotion? So maybe how does this relate? How does this idea of perception relate to uh, conditions such as autism? Interesting. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to apply this particular theory to autism. With my understanding that autism is... 
I think, mislabeled as a deficit in um, uh, being sensitive to the social layer of communication, right? So just as a case in point, studies on people with autism, uh, there's one in particular where they were shown a very dramatic scene from a film, right? And people who didn't have autism were very much in that. I think they were tracking eyes, right? Because you can do that now, like based on what you're watching, and devices that you can wear, you can track what the person is looking at. And for most people watching this scene, they're watching the faces, the emotions of the two interlocutors that are, you know, making this dramatic scene and blah, 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 blah. And in the background, because it's dramatic, there's like a light that's swinging back and forth and blah, blah, blah. People with autism couldn't keep their eyes off of the light swinging in the back. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is usually interpreted as they're not interested in or they lack the ability to focus on the socially relative components of what we normally consider the socially important, relative important parts of communication. That being the case, and because this is a neurological, um, and I don't want to say disorder anymore, it, uh, because it, it, it demonstrates neurodiversity. Is that fair? Because it demonstrates neurodiversity, I don't exactly know enough about autism to be able to place, because you know the ideas that I'm talking about, I can disassemble the brain and show you which bits and pieces um, deal with the processing of what I'm talking about. But because I don't know that about autism, I can't cross-reference the two. So I have to admit my own naivety there. Gotcha. It's a good question, though. We have another one. All right. Uh, is seasonal depression, aka the autumn blues, generally a real thing in the clinical sense, or is it more of a myth? A seasonal affective disorder, as I understand it, is in the DSM five. For those of you not familiar with what the DSM five are, the DSM stands for a Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and in America, it is published by the American Psychological Association, the APA. And it is the encyclopedia of disorders um, that provide codes, right? So in order for insurance to pay for medical services, uh, it needs a code from your provider saying that you have this disorder, right? Which triggers them unloading money for your treatment. So the DSM-5, I believe, has seasonal affective disorder, SAD, as a, as a legit thing. And, you know, as somebody who gets the blues in the autumn, uh, not necessarily the winter so much, but in the autumn, I can attest to the drop in sunlight as kind of making me feel a certain way. But like I said, I have, I have techniques. And I think we have a follow-up to that question. Is it considered a type of bipolar well, not necessarily because seasonal affective disorder and uh, let me put it differently. Let me start with bipolar. Bipolar is specifically the bi part, bi meaning two, bicycle, two wheels, bi two, is the vacillating between two different states, two poles. One of them being mania or the light version being hypomania and depression. So unless there is a manic component in the seasonal affective disorder. And if there is, then it wouldn't be seasonal affective disorder. It would fall into the bipolar category. Then I don't think that, I think that they're mutually exclusive. That seasonal affective disorder is a form of depression specifically. And that's separate from bipolar because it doesn't have the uh, bipolar one would be manic episodes. Bipolar two would be hypomanic episodes. Again, I am not a clinical psychologist. I just happen to know these things. I, I teach intro to psych, so I have to teach abnormal psych and stuff like that. So, Gotcha. Well, I was looking through the chat for more questions, and it um, it, <laughs> it kind of made me laugh a little. There's some uh, trolling of, of going on here, so uh, that's okay. So, uh, oh, yeah. Chris, I'm going to give you uh, the last 15 minutes um, to touch on maybe some important aspects of perception mm -hmm. that we haven't quite gotten to yet that will kind of provide this basis for our discussion of consciousness. 
Well, the first thing that I want to promote is the idea that understanding psychology is like being handed the handbook to being human that nobody was ever given, right? With that in mind, these ideas of how perception work and what consciousness is, again, aren't these highfalutin, obtuse, abstract ideas that are meant to live in journals that nobody reads. They're meant to be actionable um, models for how you can live your life. With our current understanding of how people perceive and how responsible we are for the way that our future selves will perceive, I think that it's only, it's only fair to share this information, right? And to remind everyone that the unexamined life isn't worth living. And maybe a part of that examined life is having a real brass tacks understanding of what perception is. How do we think? Not in the pre-sup bullshit, you know, like apologetic version of how do you know that? But literally, how do you know that? There's an answer to that that's not provided by pre-sup apologetics that is provided to you by psychology. And it has to do with your brain, understanding that your brain is not for thinking. It thinks, and th thank goodness it does, but it's really made for body budgeting. We are just skin slabs for our genes to promote themselves into the population. With that in mind, our brain is the headquarters to our skin slabs. The way that it can do its job best and be most efficient is to not only deal with what's out there, but predict what's going to be out there. That's what perception is, the simulation that we predict based on experience. You are responsible for your experiences. So those of you with mental disorders that are not neurodegenerative, but maybe along the lines of anxiety, stress, depression. There are techniques that you can grab a hold of and sink your teeth into that can facilitate literally changing your brain. Mm -hmm. Math pig, I just said literally for the first time tonight. Uh, I lied. We, we do have a few more questions. If you have the... Is it okay if I ask a few more questions? I know I told you now. I, I, that's what I'm here for. Okay. I'm here for this. <laughs> I can't, especially from Randolph. I love right. Randolph. <laughs> so, um, and uh, well said what you just said. I, that's a, yeah. So Thank Randolph you. Richardson has a question. Um, the Napoleon complex and the Jesus complex seem to be well-known conditions. Are there other such common conditions and what are they called? Um. So the Napoleon and Jesus complex are actually just different versions of, and again, I am not a clinical psychologist. Um, this is just based on my understanding of clinical psychology. Um, they are paranoid delusions. So under the diagnosis of um, delusions, they are delusions of grandeur. Right. And delusions of grandeur have very specific Napoleon, Jesus Christ, God, you know, uh, depending on the culture. And also, interestingly, depending on the culture, the people who have these complexes are either revered as shaman or put into mental institutes. Right. Mm. So let's let's think about that, how psychology is so different depending on the culture. Like what is a social reality? If you attempt to disturb this very sterile structure that we have in the West, you get put away. If, on the other hand, you know, your craziness <laughs> facilitates the social bonding of a small community, you're revered. Same problem, right? It's just two different cultures, two different contexts. Meaning is usage within context. Therefore, it has two different meanings. So... 
just to just to put a little clarification on uh, Napoleon and Jesus complex are different versions of delusions of grandeur. Are there other such common conditions? Um, when it comes to delusions of grandeur and delusions in general, I, I I think that there are. I think I wouldn't be able to list any off to you because this isn't my wheelhouse. But I do have a fun story anecdotally um, of having worked. So even though I'm not a, a clinical psychologist, I did go to graduate school for music therapy just to determine that I didn't want to be a music therapist. So I studied the DSM and I did do placements, right? And in doing in placements are just like literally I'm practicing. I am a music therapist for a pediatric population and then for a geriatric population. So for this geriatric population placement that I had, it was in a a place where I was working with people who were counselors and we were all sitting around the, you know, the, the water cooler and I was listening to stories and one of them was like, oh yeah, I worked in a psych ward where there were three Napoleons and four Jesuses. <laughs> Think about that, right? When you have a delusion of grandeur and you're confronted with another person who's claim, who's like stealing your thunder, <laughs> she was like, those were the weirdest fights ever. Like, how do you convince the person who's not Napoleon that not only are they not Napoleon, but the person that they're arguing with who thinks they are are also not Napoleon? It's wonderful conversations about, like, you, you, you didn't know what they were going to say next. Like, their insults were weird. They weren't the same kind of insults you would lob at somebody that, like, you, you, you othered mm -hmm. because you couldn't other them because they're copping your game. So it's like, so anyway, so that's the only story I have about Napoleon and Jesus complexes is gotcha. that sometimes mental wards have more than one of each of them. Okay. So I have a uh, philosophy teacher friend of mine who joined the chat. Um, and I, I think he picked up on some of the cues that you are uh, philosophically literate. And so he has a question for you. Um, what do you think of phenomenology? Do you think, I think of phenomenology? Uh, I think phenomenology is delicious. All right. I think phenomenology is delicious. I think that the, the, the idea that you can talk about individual differences, for me, that's where phenomenology, as a psychologist, that's where phenomenology has its play. Phenomenology is your experience of things, Right. And there are epiphenomenological things going on. But in talking about phenomenology, you get to acknowledge each individual difference, each individual's experience, each individual's phenomenon. You get to talk about the qualia of experience. You get philosophically and then translate that into psychology, which is like, you know, hey, is your red the same red as my red? Why do you like the smell of skunks? I think they're disgusting. Why don't you like my fart smells? I love my fart smells. Like all that to me, that is playing in the playground of phenomenology philosophically. So I would love to talk to somebody who's more um, who's more savvy about phenomenology and bounce ideas off of them. So if Dr. I dare you is interested in a conversation, I'm always available. Well, I can for sure set that up. Uh, <laughs> uh, phenomenology. I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, psych psychology is in the playground of phenomenology mm. to my mind. That would be a, a really interesting conversation. Um, I, I went to, uh, under, I did my undergrad philosophy degree with uh, Dr. I dare you, and now we teach together. So um, awesome. I he's a little bit more, um, a lot more knowledgeable about phenomenology than me. So yeah, I'll extend the offer uh, if you're listening. <laughs> so, um, okay. So um, what else, what else should we kind of lay the groundwork for? As well, far as perception goes, I think that we should just, if you if you don't mind, I'm just going to put out the teaser. This time next week, we're going to be talking about a similar topic, where the information we talked about today is foundational. So next week, we're going to take the idea of perception and apply it specifically to consciousness, and go over today's ideas were routed in the experimental research of people like Lisa Feldman Barrett and her books 
how emotions are made, and seven and a half lessons about the brain. Next week, we're going to be talking about, oh, and I just happen to have seven and a half lessons about the brain right here. Seven and a half lessons about the brain is fantastic because it's literally eight chapters that are nothing. They're nothing long. You could, you could inhale and have read a whole chapter. Like that's what they're, they're so, they're like treats, like cotton candy. Next week, we're going to be going over the research of a neuroscientist by the name of Anil Seth. His book's behind me. And we're going to be talking about consciousness this way. Oh, Jesus. In the same way that for those of you who have hallucinated, voluntarily, hopefully, through psychedelics, hallucinations are uncontrolled perceptions. Perceptions are controlled hallucinations. That's going to be the teaser for next week. That's spicy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying. I'm trying to throw some heat. I'm trying to still throw some heat at you. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, Chris, I really appreciate you taking time out of your night now uh, to come and speak with me. Um, yeah, uh, we, we got a lot of had a lot of questions for you. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation next week. For those of you in the chat, I will be speaking with Chris again, same time next Saturday. Excellent. So, looking forward to it. Thank you all for joining. Good night.